Another big tool that people use are tapping into retirement funds without taxes or penalties. Now, people say, oh, well, Patrick, I, my Edward Jones guy said I can't use that money till I'm 59 and a half. That's not true at all. You can use that money today to tap into those retirement funds and start your franchise. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infinite Financial Freedom Podcast, where we empower you with financial literacy and guide you on your journey to financial freedom. I'm Josh Metal, and I'm here today with Patrick Elsner. He's a renowned franchise consultant with over 20 years experience helping corporate executives and aspiring franchise owners to achieve their dreams. Over the last 20 years, uh, Patrick has successfully advised over 500 franchise buyers. Uh, he's been around the block, helping them escape corporate monotony and achieve financial freedom. And today we are live streaming both on X as well as YouTube. So we'll be watching for your questions, your comments. Feel free to give us a reaction if we say something that's inspiring or something that's helpful. Uh, but with that, Patrick, welcome to the show, my friend. I'm stoked to learn from you today. I appreciate it, Josh. I'm happy to be here. I look forward to sharing content. Right on, my friend. Well, listen, you and I have similar backgrounds. Uh, we have had some struggles in our early lives and have gone on eventually to find success. I think that makes us. Uh, um, I think that makes us wise teachers. I think that makes us um, people who really want to give back. So I appreciate you being here today, and I think we should just jump right in. Give us a quick explanation. What exactly is a franchise for anybody who's heard of that term but really doesn't understand the business construct? How do they work? Um, and and how does this become? How did this become a niche for you? Yeah. So my background, Josh, I sold advertising for CBS Radio, for the NBC affiliate, for the St. Louis Cardinals Radio Network. And I really got to know intimately small business owners throughout St. Louis. Some of them were franchises, and that's how I got to know the franchise discipline, that business model, that system. But a lot of them were small business owners who were struggling or floundering. Now, I couldn't articulate it at 25, but what I understood pretty quickly is they lack systems, infrastructures, and that's what a franchise is all about. If you think about McDonald's for easy context and conversation, you're not needing McDonald's to open up a burger joint, but the reason you're launching a McDonald's, it's because it's giving you the systems, infrastructure, the IP, access to technology, research, marketing, and that's really what a franchise is about. Now, you're going to pay for that, obviously, the access to that information. And McDonald's is going to make a royalty off of your gross revenue. So that's the benefit for the, to the franchise system. But it's really that business in a box that people are buying. Got it. Right on. So, you know, I think a lot of small business owners learn by mistakes and those mistakes are costly and it takes, you know, maybe five to 10 years to really iron out all the kinks. So essentially the franchise model, they say, all right, let's just fast forward all that. We've already made all those mistakes. Here's your business in the box, follow this and put your horsepower behind it as an entrepreneur. And, you know, here's the success that others have had. Is that kind of it? Just fast forward through those mistakes via the franchise? Yeah, it's not coming up with the idea. It's really executing the plan. I liken this to buying furniture at Ikea. You mm. get the instructions in the box of the furniture you buy, and you just follow the guidelines and the instructions that are given to you by Ikea. It's nothing more different than that. Like, again, going back to McDonald's, I don't necessarily know how long you need to fry those you know, French fries in the fryer, but McDonald's is going to tell you how to do all that. You're going to be trained so that all you have to do is just execute it there at the local level. So coming from a corporate America background, you know, a lot of, of people in, in corporate America that I have met are, as you say, you know, they're, they're great at execution. They necessarily didn't come up with the idea of the business, but they can lead, they can manage, they can, they can distill discipline, 
and behaviors th that they want modeled. So really, this seems like a pretty good business model for somebody that's in corporate America that already has those habits and then can just, instead of working for another company, they acquire the franchise, they come in and execute the same way they would in their, for, in their corporate America job, but now they own that business. Yeah, there's a book called Now Discover Your Strengths. He talks about mm. in the book, you can't teach a rabbit to swim, you can't teach a turtle to hop. But if you can take, <laughs> if you can take your skill sets that you acquired from working for Motorola for 20 years, you parlay that into a franchise, it's one plus one equals three, so you're taking your professional career that you've honed in corporate America, but now you actually have ownership in something and you're not subjected to the whims of a company and the layoffs and all that. Got it. One last question along those lines. Of the 500 plus franchise transactions that you've engineered, give me the persona or the... Um, the ideal person who you have seen be most successful in those franchises? Like who would that person that was perfect for franchises, who would they be? What do they look like? Yeah, somebody who's coachable, somebody who's not mm. necessarily a maverick. Um, pure entrepreneurs are really sort of rebels or mavericks. You think about guys like Ted Turner, Steve Jobs, they're never going to fit inside of a franchise model. The people that I've seen do very well with a franchise basically take the playbook and say, okay, this is what I need to do today. And mm -hmm. they execute on that plan. They don't say, well, I'm in Boise, Idaho. I don't think this is going to work in Boise. No, no, no. <laughs> they've done it. Corporate America, they've done it in corporate America. Take those same skill sets. Apply it now to your franchise model. Doesn't mean you're going to win every time, Josh, but at least you're mitigating your risk. That's a really important distinction. I'm glad that we brought that up right from the beginning. You know, the, the Richard Bransons of the world and the Richard Branson personas is, is not going to do good working inside of a franchise. But someone who's executed at a high level in corporate America and led teams, that person would likely be very successful. Out of curiosity, who uh, of your clients you've served over the last 20 years, who, who you don't have to tell me their names, but how many franchises do they have? Like, do people usually find success and then just buy more of those franchise opportunities? Or, or what? tell me a little bit of a story of somebody who's been maybe the most successful that you've worked with. Yeah, there's a, a woman down in Dallas that I place into a franchise hair salon. She started mm. off, I think, opening up two or three of these. Last time I checked, she's up to about 30 locations in DFW. Now, clearly, wow. the franchisor loves her because she's executed at the right level. She's done exactly what she needs to do. She's fantastic. Now, not everybody's as successful as her. I mean, I've had people that have got into franchising and have failed. Mm -hmm. It's not a perfect outcome every time. But if you mitigate your risk by getting into the right franchise and following the model, you got a real fighting chance. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, I mean, there must be thousands of different franchise opportunities out there. Um, I'm a real estate guy, right? So I believe in cash flow. I want, I want to, uh, I want to create passive income that exceeds my monthly spend, so that I never have to spend my my principal. I'm always just living off the cash flow. And I'm thinking about this franchise thing similarly. How, you know, how could I, how could I acquire a franchise that I need to put, I'm sure, some some energy in in the beginning. But then eventually, how could I just turn that into something that runs on its own to create passive income? So tell us about the different types of franchises. Are there franchises that you can kind of get up and running and then step back from? And it's more like a passive investment, like owning an apartment building or something like that. Give us some insights to the different types and which might be more favorable than others. Yeah, there's a guy here in St. Louis, Josh, that uh, used to be with Edward Jones. Now he has 85 Grey Clips hair salons. Wow. He obviously doesn't need a W-2 job anymore. Now, this guy's built this huge apparatus. He's got, you know, regional managers and store managers. And so he doesn't go into these stores other than to do a little politicking, you know, kiss them and hug them and all that stuff, you know, bring in a, a birthday cake. 
but that's where you want to get to. You're never going to be, you're never going to scale anything up, whether it's a franchise or an independent. If you're the chief cook and bottle washer, yeah. you've got to get to the point where you're not central to revenue production. So if you own 85 great clips, those stores are going to open today. They're going to cut people's hair and you're going to ring the cash register. Yep. Yep. I hear you. Okay. So how do you like in practice, if we kind of, you know, we, we started at 30,000 feet, we're coming down to the ground a little bit. So someone comes to you and you consult with them. How do you go about figuring out what is the right business model for that particular person? And how do you, what are your predictors or your questions or things that you need to know about that person that tell you that they'd be successful in that particular type of franchise. Yeah. So much of it is the two decades of experience that I've got. <laughs> so much of it is intuitive. I, I It's kind of like accounting. If I wanted to teach you accounting, it's pretty simple. It's an Excel spreadsheet. You plug in the formulas and it's going to come out perfectly finite. This is not a finite science. This is why people when I have a conversation with him, Josh, you're like, oh, I, I think this guy knows what he's talking about. So much of it is just intuitive in 20 years of plus doing this. But I liken this to shopping for a home. If I were going to move to Salt Lake, I don't know the difference between, you know, Provo and any other parts of Salt Lake. I'd sit down with that real estate agent and the realtor would say, Patrick, let's talk about how much you guys want to spend how many bedrooms, bathrooms, architecture home? Do you want to be more urban, suburban? Once they establish that criteria, then we do the home search. It's the same thing here with me. I have you fill out a questionnaire, get you back on the phone, I do the interview, and then I come up with specific franchises to consider. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. That was a great analogy to the realtor who, who is digging in to understand what communities, school districts, you want to be by the mountain bike trails. That 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 was a great analogy. So, Patrick, um, what of all the franchises that you have researched over the years and and have sold and, and been involved in those transactions, is there a segment or a sector of franchises that you like the most? Well, I'll, I'll flip it around on you, Josh. I will tell you the ones that I don't necessarily care okay. for. Okay, I like because- it. Because that's really what most people, when they come to me, they say, Patrick, I'm interested in opening up a Denny's. And I'll say, well, why is that? And they'll say, well, you know, I love Denny's. I was there yesterday. The place was packed. I mean, who wouldn't like the food at Denny's? And I'm like, well, have you ever owned a restaurant? Have you ever operated a restaurant? Have you ever worked in a restaurant? Well, no. So, well, you've got to understand your skill sets first. Yeah. You also have to understand opening up a Denny's might be a $2 million proposition. Oh, well, I don't have that kind of money. So that's why using that real estate analogy, it's like shopping for a home. If you tell me your budget's two fifty, I'm not going to show you million dollar homes. It doesn't make any sense. So I generally try to avoid food concepts, but then I like everything else based upon what people tell me their criteria is. Got it. That makes total sense. So, so let's talk about the range of initial capital investments since you brought that up. Could you give us some examples of what the low end range would be and then what the highest end ranges would be? And then the follow-up question to that would be, is there financing available for any of those franchises? Sure. So you can definitely get financing. Most people usually go through one of a couple different scenarios. They might get an SBA loan. So The Hmm. Small Business Administration backs the loan. The bank lends the money. SBA is not the lender, but you can get an SBA-backed loan, and that's pretty common. Another big tool that people use are tapping into retirement funds without taxes or penalties. Now, people say, oh, well, Patrick, my Edward Jones guy said I can't use that money till I'm 59 and a half. That's not true at all. You can use that money today to tap into those retirement funds and start your franchise. So those are a couple of different funding options. There's two numbers when it comes to what a franchise or looks like. You're asking about investment level. Low watermark is going to be about $75,000 cash and a net worth of about 500,000. And then it just goes up from there where you could, 
invest in hotels, what could be $10 million. Got it. Got it. Let's go back to that comment around you can use your retirement assets. So when you're saying you can use your retirement assets, are you actually talking about the mechanism of cashing, selling the, those, whatever the assets are in that retirement account, pulling it out of that investment and then buying the franchise? Or are you talking about borrowing against those assets? Yeah, great question. So you can do one of two things. You can borrow against your securities. There's a loan. It's like a line of credit, not unlike a home equity line of credit, Josh. You can borrow against your securities, a line of credit against those, or you can take some of that money that's in your 401k or your IRA and use it today. Now, the way it works is this. Let's say you have a million dollars in your 401k at Motorola. You can use some of that money to fund your franchise. What you're basically doing is taking that money out of, say, American Century Mutual Funds, and you're just opening up your own corporation as a franchise. Interesting. So are you saying that the the the, the, the franchise then isn't owned by like the IRA? I mean, I know there's self-directed IRAs, right? So right. you can do private money lending with it. You can buy real estate in your IRA. You can buy cryptocurrency in your IRA. Um, self-direct it rather than in, into traditional securities. So are you saying that you would actually acquire the business like inside of an IRA? You, you're, I don't, don't want to get too, too deep into it because people's eyes are going to glaze over. But <laughs> the, the, the net of it is this. If I have a million dollars in an IRA or a 401k and it's all in stocks, mutual funds, equities, you can take some, all, a little, a lot, and you can use it to fund your franchise startup without tech taking a penalty. Because the way the IRS views it, Josh, is this. You're still keeping that money in a qualified plan, but you're just changing the investments. Now, your guy at Edward Jones will go, oh, you don't want to do that. That's okay. He has his own selfish reasons for that. Right. But if you took 400000 of that million and you launched your franchise, you're not getting taxed or penalized because the IRS says, well, he's not doing a withdrawal. He's just shifting where his investments are. Sure. Makes total sense to me. And then as we go back to the financing, as it relates to the SBA, is the SBA doing the acquisition of the real estate and the build out, or are they doing those things and financing part of the acquisition of the franchise fee? So the SBA is the underwriter for the bank. Mm -hmm. So Huntington Bank is going to lend you the money for mm -hmm. your three McDonald's you're going to open. Mm -hmm. The SBA is just saying to Huntington Bank, hey, we've got you covered, Huntington Bank. We're going to make sure Patrick is going to be covered on that loan. So the SBA is sort of a an insurance policy, sure. kind of like FDA, FDIC would insure your your uh Positive. your savings account yeah from uh, mm -hmm. sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you keep going no that's okay so it, it's really about having that guarantee by the sba you're lending the money getting the money from huntington to you to launch your business the sba is just nothing more than an insurance policy but the relationship is between you the franchisor and huntington bank Understand. And the money that comes from Huntington Bank, as, a, as an example, could be any bank that does SBA loans, right. that money that is borrowed from them, insured by the SBA, can those funds go to acquire the real estate that's involved, um, do the build out that's required, and pay the franchise fee? All of the above. I didn't the know way, that. Okay. The way, yeah, the way you do the business plan when you work with the bank is you're basically saying, here's why I need $400,000. And you're going to lay it out, franchise fee, build out, working capital, equipment, whatever it might be. Got it. So I know in the real estate world, um, I dabbled with SBA before and have looked at that financing. I've actually helped clients arrange SBA financing. And it was 90%, as I recall, of the uh, of the real estate acquisition, the build out, and even some of the equipment. 
is that similar in the franchise model that you all the thing all the buckets you just mentioned and the SBA will go up to 90%? Yeah, the, the, the percentages are different depending upon the project and the individual. But, you know, I've seen cash injections as low as 2%. I've seen wow. cash injections as high as 30%. Um, I just helped somebody get a, uh, a term loan. Um, and, and so, again, everything is different. What we do when we work with people, Josh, is I have a team that helps people navigate the funding sources that are out there. So... I help them find the franchise. My then uh, funding team helps them figure out funding. Great. The, the reason I'm digging into this, Patrick, is because, you know, I, I want to make these ideas for people as approachable as possible. And if they think, well, I have to have $2 million, um, that's not approachable for a lot of people. But if they know there's SBA financing out there, now it becomes way more approachable. So thank you for clarifying okay. those details. I think it was really important. Yeah, look, there, there are every franchisor has certain markers. Like I'll give you an example, Panera Bread. Panera mm -hmm. Bread won't even talk to you unless you have a net worth of $7 million and $3 million liquid. Plus they want to know that you've operated restaurants. Every franchisor has similar criteria. Obviously some are not as lofty as Panera, but that's why I have people fill out this questionnaire, do this interview. That way, when I make the recommendations, I'm laser focused on those recommendations. And I'm assuming, just because I'm, I'm curious about this, but I'm assuming Panera has had enough um, track behind them that they have been able to discern, hey, these people make it, they have staying power. These people don't make it when there's a dry patch and they fold and they don't want to have a black eye on their brand. And so they're saying, these are the criteria of the people who we see succeed at a very high percentage. Is that right? Or is there any other reason for, for those criteria? You absolutely nailed it. Every franchisor has a sort of an avatar. They're looking for a type of personality. One of the franchises I represent called Serta Pro Painters, they have hmm. candidates fill out a personality assessment. Wow. And if they don't fit those markers, the likelihood they're gonna be awarded a franchise is slim and none. And, and that's good not only for Serta Pro, but it's good for the candidate and ultimately the customers who would be customers of Serta Pro. So people often think that I'm buying a franchise and it's not the case. What you're doing is you're launching a franchise after you've been approved by the franchisor, but you have to fit that set of criteria. It's great. Fantastic. I mean, it's really in the best interest of both parties. I don't want to lose my capital and, and lose out on a loan that I've taken out in this franchise and the franchise or doesn't want to uh, have a black eye because they've closed a location, right? That's right. 100%. Franchisors only make money on the downstream royalties. They're banking mm. on you being uber successful. Great Nothing point. can make them happier. Great point. They don't want to invest time and energy to get you all set up and then have you fold nine months later. That exactly. super, super insightful. Okay, let's take a little bit of a left turn here. By the way, I've learned a ton in 20 minutes from you, Patrick. So thank you. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, say again, if anybody is watching live on X or on our YouTube channel and you have questions, we're watching those, feel free to drop those questions in, we'll answer them. And if you're watching these question, this uh, video after the live broadcast, um, put your questions in. I'll forward them to Patrick because I'm probably not going to know the answer and uh, we'll, we'll get your questions answered. Patrick, I think a lot about, you know, I mentioned to you, I'm, I'm dressed in this funny beanie and this shirt because my, my son, my 14 year old son and I are headed to Deer Valley right after our podcast together. We're going to do some, some skiing today. And I, I talk to him a lot about the changing world around us. Um, I got to meet your, your college age daughter before we kicked off. I'm sure you're thinking and have similar conversations, but I think a lot about, you know, artificial intelligence. I think a lot about quantum computing. I think a lot about this technology revolution that seems to be accelerating much faster than I've seen over the last 25 years. And so I, I'm curious to ask you, what industries do you see flourishing in the years ahead alongside with this kind of advancement of technology and artificial intelligence? Any thoughts along those lines? 
Yeah, it, it's hard to really peek around that corner and really understand because there are some things that right. I don't see AI ever replacing. Like I went last week to Great Clips and got my hair cut. Like I, I don't see how <laughs> AI is going to do that. No. Um, so I, there are some things I'm still sort of scratching my head, but there's no question about it. The world is changing at a rapid pace business and you know, who knows what, what, what's going to come a year from now, 10 years from now, what, you know, our kids are going to experience. But at least if you're partnering with a franchise, you have other individuals, you have a parent company that is already planning five, 10 years ahead in anticipation of changes. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, when I talk to my son, I, I say something similar in that, I share, it's it's almost impossible to know how this evolves. I mean, we can't comprehend how quantum computing and AI is going to impact us over the next 10 years. But some things that I think we'll always have space for, and you'll always be able to earn an income and a living in, uh, I think it's really hard to automate um, the owning of real property, right? I mean, people are going to need a place for their families forever. Um, right. People are going to need a place to go to a gym. They're going to need a place to congregate and be social. So, so owning real estate, I think, is disruption proof in that way where artificial intelligence and quantum computing isn't, isn't going to disrupt that. Now, are there types of real estate like we're seeing in office that are going to get disrupted? For sure, but also some, some, some that, um, that will not. Uh, I tell him leadership. You know, I don't know how you can artificially intelli intelligence through having empathy for what people are going through, giving them hope, inspiring them, showing them a, a different possibility than they thought was possible for themselves. So I think leadership, uh, I think sales um, to a certain degree is really hard to, to make connection and trust through automation. And I think a lot of I would think restaurants, like how do you, how do you, how does quantum computing take away the fact that people love to go to cool restaurants and hang out with one another? But I was just curious if you had any insights to those, those uh, specific franchises who you think will do very well. Any, any other franchises come to mind? Yeah. I mean, anything that's a service-based business, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, think about it, you know, Monday we had the lawn mowed by a landscape company. Tuesday, we had someone clean our home. You know, Wednesday, we got a haircut. Thursday, we went out to dinner. I mean, there are things that are service-based related, Josh, that I just don't see being uh, eliminated. Now, technology will certainly help, but I just don't think certain things are going to be eliminated. I mean, we yeah. always thought about, you know, oh my gosh, Amazon, look what Amazon did to retail businesses. That's true, but I don't think Jeff Bezos is going to send a drone to your house to cut your hair. <laughs> if he does, we're all in trouble, Patrick. <laughs> exactly. I'll, I'll meet you on the ski hill. We'll call it. A, we'll call it a career. <laughs> Why do you think? You know, I I think that there are so many unfulfilled. I won't use the word unhappy, but unfulfilled people in corporate America. I mean, they are spending their entire lives and their entire lives energy to essentially create real wealth for others. And yes, of course, they have a little piece of that along the way. But I believe there's a lot of unfulfillment in corporate America. Why do you think more of them don't say, screw this? I'm going to go I'm going to go spend my life's energy building something for me that I'm actually not just getting a paycheck but I'm building equity. Yeah. It, it goes back to when we were little kids. You know, your son is 14. I'm sure you've had the conversations, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he says, you know, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be the next Patrick Mahomes or the next Celine Dion. Fisherman. All he wants to do is fish. That's it. His entire life. <laughs> hey, and, and, and you know what? What I would do is I would foster those dreams and encourage them. You know, yeah. there's only going to be so many people like Patrick Mahomes, okay? Yeah. And, and God love him. He's living his dream, his passion. And on top of it, he's making a lot of money. 
For the rest of us, we just got to figure out how to make a living. But here's the big lie that we were told by the education system in this country. Mm. It cranks out employees to work for corporate America and mm. other people. Mm. Now, the book, you know, the book series by Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he talks about it in his book, The Conspiracy of the Rich. That education system is not designed to crank out independent thinkers. It's put them in a box, go to high school, get your uh, degree in college, and you come to work for corporate America. The problem is the guy who's 45 sitting in his office at Motorola today, looking out the window, miserable. The problem is he's stuck. Big mortgage. Kids want to go to college. Mm. Lifestyle. He can't leave that job. Mm. So he's got to figure out a way to do it on the side. And a lot of people use real estate or franchising as sort of a mechanism to maybe bridge that gap. Yeah, let's go down that path. That was a that was really insightful. So let's just say I'm uh, 45. I'm 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 in the middle of my career, maybe even on the back half, and um, I'm I know that I'm unfulfilled. Um, I would like to build something on my own. I don't really know how. How how does one exit that Motorola job or that unfulfilling corporate America job into the franchise world? How long is it before I start to receive income from that franchise world? And, and is there a way to do it as a side hustle until it gets substantial enough to, to fully exit? What does that look like? Yeah, you can definitely do it on the side. The gen- gentleman that I mentioned that owns the 85 Great Clips I mean, he started off with one store while he was still working at Edward Jones. Ah. And you can certainly do that. So what a lot of people that I place in franchising today, they say, okay, Patrick, got the big mortgage, the kids in college, can't leave the job, but how do I start something on the side? Mm -hmm. And that's what most people do. So they start small and then they get a couple of stores opened up. And then once they make enough money, they say, bye-bye corporate America. I don't need you anymore because now I've got 28 super cuts. And so you see that very commonly. That's what a lot of people do. It's a perceived safety and security of the W-2 job. Love it. Absolutely love it. Okay. So, So let's just say today, Patrick, I say, I'm interested in this franchise model. I've got my main hustle, but uh, I want to get going down this path. What's the, give me the long and the short timelines between us having that initial conversation and actually just walk me through the timeline. Like what would happen between now and when I actually get a check and start getting income from that investment? Yeah. So somebody would fill out my questionnaire. It takes five minutes to fill out. I get them back on the phone. I interview them. I do my research. I come back and recommend some concepts. They do the investigation. Investigation typically is about 60 to 90 days. Okay. At that point, they say, Patrick, this is the franchise I'm going to join. They get approved by the franchise or they sign an agreement. So let's say we're 90 days in at this point. Now, if it's a retail based business, Josh, it's going to take them upwards probably of a year to actually get open. Because you need a location, so, build out. Yeah. Okay. Selection, build out, lease negotiation, all those things. So I would say by the time you see dollar one, it might be 18 months before you actually see day one of profit. But that's okay because you're still at Motorola. But what you're doing is you're taking the hockey stick approach. And eventually, you know, you get to that point where you've got your stores open and maybe you don't need that job in corporate America. Yeah, got it. And is it easier to open the... Six, seven, eight, nine, tenth location uh, than it is the first one. Did the I'm assuming that the once you're successful, the guy who owns 85 Great Clips, uh, pretty easy to get him approved for another franchise location. But have you have you? I assume that learning curve is steep on the first one and pretty simple thereafter. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean that 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 first one. You know, you're having sleepless nights. You're having buyer's remorse. You're going, geez, what did I get into? You know, <laughs> your the location you wanted, somebody came in and and took it out from underneath you. Or, I mean, there, there's all, I mean, it's, it's wrought with all kinds of challenges and problems. But, you know, I tell everybody, 
this is a marathon, not a sprint. This yeah. isn't like I'm going to go to work for Motorola tomorrow and in two weeks from now, I'm going to get a paycheck. It's yeah. not how this yeah. works. This is playing the long game, Josh. And that's really the key. So go ahead, keep the job, corporate America. Let's slowly start to open up our franchise locations. And in given time, you'll get there and it'll be okay. Great. Yeah, that's insightful. Patrick, do you see people tend to buy um, various different types of franchises? Like I'm thinking about in the investment world, diversification. I'm thinking in the real estate world, I want to own some apartment buildings. I want to own some medical office buildings. I want to order off, uh, um, own some re retail and I want to have some diversification. So if I happen to have a concentration in office that goes to shit, I can rely on my apartment buildings and my retail and my medical office. Is there, do you see that in the, in the franchise world? Yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, I've seen franchise owners own franchises in, in the hair salon space, coupled with something in automotive, coupled it within home services. It's just like anything. You don't want to be all on Apple stock or 20 you know, century mutual funds. You definitely want to have that diversification play, but you can also diversify within the franchise system by having multiple locations. You might have an A location, a B location, and a C location. Great point. Small cap, mid cap, uh, large cap. <laughs> Absolutely. Right on, right on. Okay, so in the real estate world, uh, which of course I keep going back to just because that's what I know and it helps me understand other industries, we measure uh, your your total return from an investment. And to stay away from confusing jargon, you know, we want to know, all right, what's the what's the cash flow expected to be over the first 10 years? Uh, how much are we going to pay down the debt? You know, that's called the amortization of the debt over that 10 year period. Uh, how much do we anticipate the property to appreciate over that period of time? Is there tax deductions that are going to play into this? And at the at the end, we come up with a total return. Um, and 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 I and there's kind of a benchmark, you know, in, in real estate that that I'd be shooting for. So tell us a little bit about different ways that somebody gets paid as a franchise owner, right? I just gave you a couple as a real estate owner how we're paid or how we're rewarded. I guess you could be you could say. So so number one, that's my first question, and then my second question would be. What kind of total return would somebody be looking at over a 10-year period? So if you're looking at total return, I look at it in terms of an annual distribution. Let's say you're making 20%. I'll just use this Gray Clips for you know simple back of the envelope calculations. You have 85 Gray Clips and an average store, let's say nets 400,000 in, in revenue. You might be taking home, say, $60,000 of that in terms of net profit to your bottom line. So $60,000 times whatever 85 stores, that's what you're making. That's your net return. Yeah, no, now, now, those 85 stores, though, there's a composite value, obviously, if he decides to sell all those 85 stores in a lump sum and move to Europe. You have that as an asset value there, mm -hmm. just like you with your millions of dollars with a real estate. You have that, but you have cash flow every day. And I would assume, I mean, it's going to be the same thing. You're going to have debt on that real estate if you own the real estate or debt on perhaps that franchise. Um, and each month as you're making those payments, you're 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 paying down the value of that or the 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 amount of that debt as well. So it seems to me like you'd be essentially be paid exactly as a real estate investor. You've got the cash flow, you've got the appreciation of the business. Over time, you would assume you would grow the business and the valuation of the business would grow if you if you were to sell it. And you'd have the pay down of the debt over time. Is there any other piece that I'm missing there? No, that's really it. I mean, you're you're just like any business, you've got a PL, you've got a balance sheet, and you're you're managing these pieces, whether it's 85 great clips or 85 units of an apartment building, the discipline is still going to be the same. You're basically, you know, you've got tenants and you've got customers. Yeah. So that, that's really what the equation is the same. 
Yeah. And have you ever run the numbers? Like, do you, do you have a, 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 an equation or a calculator or do the, does the franchise or give you kind of like ballpark uh, return on investment numbers? And, and does that usually just encompass the cash flow or does it ever encompass the appreciation of the business and the pay down of the debt into that calculation? Usually it's a calculation of the, the cash flow. Okay. The beauty of the franchise model like if you bought 85 units of an apartment complex, you can look at the cap rates and you could say, okay, here's the debt, here, here's, you know, amortization. You know, you can look at that on a spreadsheet and you can change the numbers and tweak them and all that. It's not unlike looking at a franchise, Josh. So if you're going to open up a great clips, you're going to, you're going to put together P and L and you're going to talk to other franchise owners, whether it's in Richmond, Virginia, St. Louis, Salt Lake, LA, and they're going to help you build that cash flow and look at that P&L and pro forma and determine what those numbers are going to be before you actually launch. And are there some benchmarks that you could give me an idea? Like if we're just talking about cash flow, you know, if I'm going to invest $400,000 into a Great Clips or I think you said $2 million in a Panera Bread, what would you estimate the cash flow return on investment would be for those franchises? Yeah, percentage wise, you're looking at 15 to 20 to 25 percent is pretty typical. I mean, it's not unlike, yeah, it's not unlike what you would look at in terms of real estate. Now, I don't know many real estate offerings that are doing 15, 20, 25 percent, but that's what you're going to look at is 15, 20, 25 percent is pretty typical. Okay. And is that, are those types of returns encompassing? Uh, someone paying cash for the franchise, uh, or is that more like uh, even if you had if you had debt on it, then that would bring down that return. Is that accurate? Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah if you if you've got debt service, sure, naturally it's going to reduce your uh, percentage of gain. And again, a lot of it's going to depend. Like some people that tap into their retirement funds go into the business without any debt, so now it's all upside in terms of that return. Yeah, that makes great sense. Man, Patrick, this has been super exciting. What what uh, an insightful for me. What questions haven't I asked? What are some 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 gotchas or some things that you've learned over the years that might not be um evident to the people on the outside of this industry? It's the fear, it's the fear that gets everybody, Josh. Everybody goes through a point in their life where they say, you know what? I'm tired of working for the man. Maybe yeah. I should start a business. And then the mind starts playing tricks on you. Oh, you know, you probably shouldn't do that. You, you know, you, you got a good job. Stay where you're at. It's the devil you know. And it's the fear that stops so many people down. And I see it all every day in my business. Most people don't end up fulfilling their desire to own a franchise solely based upon they're just scared. They yeah. are just scared. And then there are the people that launch a franchise and they're 28 stores in and like, yeah, it's been hard, but they soldier on and they make it work. And that's the difference. Henry Ford has a great quote. And, and, the, and the quote is, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. It's all in how you approach it. You either are going to say, I'm going to open up 85 gray clips or, oh, this is really hard. I don't think I can do it. I can't find the stylus and I'm having a hard time finding a location. Yeah, that's business. Your, yeah. your, your job at, at Motorola sucks sometimes too. <laughs> Probably sucks most of the time too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was talking to one of my my good friends and he's become a, a business partner of me and we we um we invest together a lot and and I was telling him the other day I said you know I can't think of a single deal that I've closed that there wasn't a moment in time where I thought dang it I think I'm overpaying for this property um I I can't tell you how many times I've walked out of a title company uh, to get some fresh air and to and to reconsider if I want to move forward on this investment, and in in hindsight, uh, I don't own a single property that I've owned for more than two years that I didn't think, dang it, I wish I would have bought one more just like it. 
It's like, you just have to come face to face with that. Well, first, I think you need to have a process that you can trust. You know, it's a lot easier for me now. I mean, I can, I can take a swing at a $20 million property um, with the same level of confidence that I used to take a swing at a two hundred or, or $80,000 property because we've done it so many times. I have a process. I, I, I can, I can bifurcate fear and desire and, and, and say, okay, here's the risks. Here's the downside. Here's how I can get out of this thing. Here's the upside. Here's all the modeling. So I think part of it is experience, but I guess what I want to impart with people is fear is healthy. If you allow it to sharpen your process of evaluation, fear is not healthy. If you let it dominate you emotionally and not move forward and make progress, I'm sure you've dealt with this over and over and over with the clients that you consult with. Any advice around this or anything you'd add? Yeah, you, you got to put fear in perspective. I mean, fear is a natural instinct that's designed to keep us aware and yes. uh, to let us know that, hey, this might be a problem. But yeah. you know what? Work is still a four-letter word. Just because you own 85 Great Cliffs doesn't mean life is a bed of roses it's still going to be a challenge. You're still going to have to deal with employees. They're going to be a pain in the ass sometimes. I mean, you're, you're going to have challenges no matter what. But the difference is between the guy who owns the 85 Grey Clips and the guy who's at Motorola, the guy who owns the 85 Grey Clips can say, you know what? It's raining today. I don't think I'm going to leave the house. The guy at Motorola says, you better get down to one waterway place because you got a job and your boss is expecting you here. Yeah. Amen. Really well said. I think the last question, and then I want to make sure we leave uh, folks with how to get a hold of you, how to follow your uh, podcast, how to, how to really learn more about this. But the last question I'll have for you has to do with inflation. And I've been, uh, and Patrick's like, Hey, this was, we didn't talk about this question. Here comes the curveball, Patrick. I want to. I was doing some research on a on a presentation I'm building. I'm going to just share this slide for anybody who's watching on video and not on the podcast. But um, this is a this is a map, uh, a graph rather, excuse me, of inflation in the U.S. going back to 1910. And if you're if you're looking at this graph, what you would see is that from 1910 to 1970. Inflation was relatively flat. I mean, yes, it did go up, but we're talking about 60 years here. So it was just kind of, uh, I would say, manageable inflation. And then in 1971, which is when Nixon took us off the gold standard, temporarily, by the way, Patrick, um, you just see inflation just completely, you know, take a hockey stick up upward turn. And so I share that with you because I'm curious if we're aware that inflation is eroding the dollar power, uh, the buying power of the U.S. dollar, then what businesses do you see, as, what franchises, as the most inflation resistant, meaning that they have the ability to raise prices with, uh, with in lockstep with inflation or perhaps even faster than inflation? Yeah, I like dull, boring businesses, uh, businesses that are here today, here tomorrow, businesses that outsource a foreign country or Amazon. Like I'll give you an example. If you come home from your ski trip today and you have a foot of water in your basement, you're going to call somebody and they're going to take care of that. This is not an elective procedure. You're going to get that taken care of. So you're going to call a plumber. They're going to stop the leak. Then you're going to call a restoration company. You're going to call your insurance company. So dull, boring businesses are always the best way to go. Great point. And businesses that you need. I like that analogy. It, it doesn't matter if that uh, plumber and or um, restoration company at that moment costs me $500 or $1,000. I'm calling them. And if they can get out here, I'm going to pay it. Absolutely. I just had to have my uh, HVAC system replaced to the tune of 15 grand. It was August and 105 here in St. Louis. What am I going to do? Question them, you know. <laughs> Let me get three more bids before I do this. No, it's like, get over here, get this thing taken care of. Dull, boring businesses always are what I like the most. 
Dude, great advice. Great way to end this podcast, Patrick. Thank you. How do people find you, follow you, contact you? Yeah, real simple URL. It's franinside.com. So F-R-A-N inside.com. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. I've got a YouTube channel as well. So lots of ways, just uh, Google my name or look me up on LinkedIn. And is your YouTube channel Fran Inside? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right on. Very good. Patrick, thank you for sharing so generously with me. Uh, this was a ton of fun. I learned a lot and I appreciate you being on the Infinite Financial Freedom Podcast.